Hello, welcome to another Soundbooth tutorial. I'm your host, Daniel Jason Booth. Today we're looking at tuning reverbs. Thanks for joining me today. So let me begin by saying that this is not something I would normally do in terms of um, how I would set up my reverbs. Generally speaking, I'm the sort of person who would tune reverbs by ear. But um, what I've found is this, uh, it's an idea in a book called Mixing With Your Mind. Basically, what it involves is setting up a pink noise generator, which I've got here. And if I just, I've got a gate after that. It sounds a little bit like white noise. The gate that comes after it is there basically to take the side chain signal from a click so that it only opens when the signal receives a click track. So in this case, whatever I set the tempo to, it's going to open with that. We'll set it at 80. From there, what we'll do is we are going to send it to some different reverbs. And the idea of this is that you start a new mix and you have all your available reverbs that you're going to use for the song. You can use this technique to dial them in. I'll give you an example of that. So let's send it out to the hall. Okay, so it's sending out to the mix bus and it's sending out to this hall, which is here. Let's send the pink noise through it. I'll just start playing with the controls and uh, we'll learn how this reverb sounds based on what we're hearing with the pink noise. So this is pink noise. Now we're going to send it additionally to the hall. Okay, and so we could go on and on and on and, and play with these settings. Uh, the idea is that you learn how the reverb itself is affecting the tonality of the original signal. Now, pink noise is a bunch of different frequencies all at the same time, essentially, and it's a pretty consistent sound, and it's not something that you generally are going to listen to so much, but you'll listen to the quality of the sound and how the quality of that sound changes. And I'll give you an example. So if, as soon as we put this on, okay, so we understand that's how it sounds. It immediately tells us how it's affecting it frequency wise, how the frequencies are developing over time. And it's also giving us other cues on the size of the room and a whole bunch of things that help us to understand what each of these controls do. You can read as much as you like about pre-delay and why it's important and some guides on how to set it. But um learning how to set up a reverb just by ear and how the tonality of that changes over time but also how the reverb itself interacts with the dry sound you know that's a really important aspect 
of mixing. I think in the book it was offered up as a way of tuning your reverbs before you start mixing. I don't necessarily agree with that. I think it's it's more of a an exercise in how a reverb sounds and how it changes sound and how you can dial it in for different tempos. So if we had a faster tempo, say, you know, that You can hear that the tail of the sound is too big. So what happens if we back off the pre-delay and we'll, we'll increase the room size gradually. So for me, it's not been a bad way to understand what the different types of reverbs are. Let's go to our plate reverb. What it can be good for is working out what frequencies you send into a reverb are actually going to take off. And what you can do is you can put an EQ before it and more or less tune out all the stuff that you don't need, any kind of build ups. Probably don't need a whole bunch of that low end. So it's a good way of kind of preempting how things might sound when they come out the other end on the return of the reverb. This is more of a concept that I wanted to explore. It has helped me over the years in understanding what pre-delay is, what, how the decay time works, how early reflections versus the tail of a reverb differ and how to get the balance um, of those against each other how the reverb relates to the direct sound. Now, if we have a look at the spring reverb, it is a very different beast. Immediately, I don't want to use as much of it, and we don't have an option for a pre-delay on this one, so, so I'll put a delay in front of that, and that will become our pre-delay. And what I want to do is probably shorten the convolution reverb. So 
what that tells us is a lot of the tail of that convolution reverb is actually quite dark and a lot of the bright part of it is in the beginning. So if we had a really slow tempo, suddenly a lot of the settings change and so it's good to be aware of how the tail of the reverb affects things in terms of how the tail will smear and start to affect the sound of the direct sound. When you're trying this technique make sure you're looking at the pre-delay times based on your tempos, um, your choice of reverbs. Maybe if we go over to the room sound we'll give another one a go. So this is a convolution on an LX 47L, sorry 48L of a large wooden room. which would be probably too short, really. Probably more suitable to a faster tempo. And judging by what it looks like here, it looks like it's got a little bit of a pre-delay before it actually has the full bloom of the reverb. Probably good for snare drums. Whatever reverb you've got, whatever reverb plugin you've got, I truly believe even if it's stock, just maybe going through listening to the pink noise that's gated and sending that into these different reverbs, they can direct you more technically on what you need to do to get these to sound better. And after time, I think you'll gain a much better understanding when you're listening to a vocal or a snare drum or whatever it is that you're sending through that reverb. You'll get a much better understanding of what parameters you'll need to change in order to get a specific sound out of that reverb. So let me know how you go. Maybe you think it's a waste of time and that's totally fine, but maybe some of you will find this quite a handy technique. So let me know in the comments section below and uh, as ever, like, share, subscribe, and I will see you next week. Happy mixing guys.